This book in the Bible, Genesis, Genesis chapter 25. One of the proofs to the Bible being uh, historical accounts instead of fable and legend is that the Bible presents its heroes in a very honest light, often in a very unflattering light. In other words, the Bible just tells the truth about its heroes, even if it doesn't make its heroes look so good. For example, Abraham, who is the uh, father of the Jewish people, was a liar. He had sexual relationships with his servant, David, who all kings were compared to. Uh, he had the infamous sin with Bathsheba that included murder. Peter, maybe one of the greatest disciples that Jesus had, denied even knowing Jesus. Paul, he hastily dismissed the younger missionary, Mark. And so all of these and many more are examples of people in the Bible that though they are the heroes of faith and heroes of the Bible, they are far from perfect. They sinned, they murmured, and they rebelled. They sound a lot like us, don't they? Well, today we begin a series on the second half that makes the lights go off. We begin a series on the second half of the summer called Messy Life. It's a study of the character Jacob. And Jacob was quite a messy personality. In fact, Jacob is gonna end up having his name changed to Israel and the very nation today called Israel gets its name and its heritage from this character we're going to study named Jacob, who is quite a messy character, to say the least. Uh, today, I, I want to introduce this character, Jacob, to you by showing you kind of where he comes from, a little bit about his family background and just some of the early things that he does, because most messy lives have a messy background. And because most of us have something messy about us, there's a good chance that there's something in our background, our family, that is messy. And we'll see that in this passage that we have a lot in common with our character, Jacob. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 25, starting with verse 19, and read the, this uh, information that introduces the character that we're going to study for six or seven weeks. It says in Genesis 25, verse 19, these are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took his wife, Rebekah. And then it gives the lineage of Rebekah. Skip down to verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord was receptive to his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. But the children inside of her struggled with each other, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to the Lord and inquired, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you and, and will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger." When her time came to give birth, there were indeed twins in her womb. The first one came out red-looking, covered with hair like a fur coat. They named him Esau. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Verse 27, when the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter, an outdoorsman. But Jacob was a quiet man. He stayed around the home. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the field exhausted. He said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted that is why he was named Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright 
Look, said Esau, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright going to do me? And Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to Jacob and sold, uh, and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. Esau ate, drank, got up, and went away. Esau despised his birthright. Now, verses 19 through 26 are actually transitioning from the first major character in the book of Genesis that ends up leading us to this long lineage that's going to end in the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's why all these stories are important because they are all part of the family lineage that gets us to the Messiah. That first personality was Abraham, and so this kind of closes out the story of Abraham and Isaac, and then it leads us to the next personality, which is Jacob and his twin brother Esau, and Jacob is our character today. So let me show you four things about messy backgrounds. See if you can relate to any of them. First is this, we all come from imperfect families. Now, if your family's with you right now, don't make eye contact. We all come from imperfect families. Jacob's father was Isaac. And the account of Isaac is really summarized under Isaac's father, which is Abraham. Abraham is the bigger personality. Abraham overshadows his son, Isaac. Abraham is the one who God came to him when he was in the land that he grew up in called the land of Ur and said, leave the land you're familiar with. Go to a place, I'll show you in the future where it is. Trust me, I'm gonna give you a land that you can dwell in. And Abraham trusts God and he follows God and he gets to that point. And there's that, that, those great faith stories about Abraham, but also Abraham was a mess. I mean, Abraham lied about his wife two different times to get out of trouble. Don't throw your wife under the bus to get out of trouble. Abraham did that. Abraham also, God said to him, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And Abraham looked at his wife, Sarah. She wasn't getting any younger. In fact, she's getting older and older and older and older. And finally, Abraham, with Sarah's uh, permission and actual encouragement, had sexual relationships with a servant lady there. And she became pregnant. And Abraham counted that as the son of promise. But really, God had his son of promise in mind. And it was going to be through Sarah. And it was going to be Isaac. Isaac was somewhat like his father. He threw his wife under the bus also. Guys, we're not learning much here, are we? And, and, but he, he did do some things good. When his wife could not have children, instead of going to the maid servant, he prayed to God. So that's something definitely he did right. He prayed to God, and God heard his prayer, and God answered his prayer by giving Rebecca not just a son, but giving her twins. And so we see that uh, Jacob comes from uh, a messy background. And while Isaac lives under the shadow of Abraham and under the shadow of his son, Jacob, Jacob and his brother Esau will end up having a struggle and a battle that'll last half of their life. The study of Jacob, though, is going to lead us to have to struggle with some issues, some controversial things. And th th this is the very first one. Can God use imperfect people? Now, we know the answer to that, but still we wonder how does God use imperfect people? Because if God didn't use imperfect people, nobody would ever have been used. Because from the very first creation, Adam and Eve, People have been imperfect. And somehow, in God's infinite wisdom, in God's great security in who he is, he created humans with a free will, and sometimes they use that free will to do ugly things, to sin, and that sin makes us quite imperfect. And Jacob is a great example of God using imperfect people. And the reason why God used Jacob, it's not because he was perfect, it because, it's because God is perfect. And God can use you not because you have a clean past, not because everything is, is Sunday school perfect. God can use you because he is perfect, not because you are perfect. And yet, we shouldn't use that as an excuse to live in sin or to live in deception, which is what Jacob does 
for half of his life. Each person reaches a point in their life where they realize their parents aren't perfect. And you might even realize that your parents have done some pretty terrible things, like committed some bad sins. And you have two choices when you get to that point in your life. You can allow their imperfection to define you and follow in that same path. It might sound something like this. Well, my mom was a drug addict. I can't help it. It's in my genes. I'm going to be a drug addict. Or my parents were divorced, so I can't help it. It's just it's what's going to happen to me. I'm, I'm going to be divorced. We can follow in that pattern. We can choose to, to be like that. Or we can choose to say, I love my parents, even though they're not perfect. I'm not perfect either as a child or as a grown child. I'm not perfect either. I'm going to love my parents. I'm going to learn what I can from my parents. But then I'm going to invite God's involvement in my life even more, which is really what all of us need, no matter what our age is. We need to invite God's involvement in our lives even more. As messy as Jacob's life was, and it was quite messy, his story changes when his wife, Rachel, is able to have a child named Joseph. And in fact, Jake, Jacob's life, it, it looks like two opposites. The first half of his life, he, he steals, he tricks, uh, he, he, he runs for his life. And the second half of his life, he is giving, he's generous, and he returns home. And no matter how messy your life is or your family's life is, God can turn things around. Previous mess-ups do not have to be your lasting legacy. That is not permission for us to go and mess up. It is just the truth that your previous mess-ups don't have to be the legacy that everybody remembers you by. Second thing to look at, parental favoritism and sibling rivalries are often part of our background. Now, in this story, as it begins to start transitioning from Abraham to this next major character in Genesis, which is Jacob, who we're studying, in this introductory to Jacob, there are three different stories that show how Jacob and his twin brother are going to be struggling. The first story is found in verse 22. Is it says that, the boys inside of Rebekah, inside the womb, are struggling with each other. I like how an old translation reads. It says they were jostling with, with each other. And that word struggle means a violent collision. So here's twins inside the mother, and they're having a violent collision with each other. It means crushing or breaking. Actually, the verb form that's used means that it was reciprocated. In other words, one boy was throwing a blow, and the other boy was throwing a blow back. One boy was kicking, and the other boy was kicking. And all this was happening inside the poor mom to the point that she finally goes to God and says, God, what in the world's going on? She probably thought, I mean, I heard pregnancy was tough, but I didn't know it was going to be this tough. These kids, they're not going to do me much good if they kill each other inside the womb. That's probably what she was thinking. So the first struggle is before birth, while they're inside the mother. The second struggle found in verse 24 and following is when the birth occurs. So when the birth occurs, Esau is born first, but Jacob comes out still fighting, grabbing his heel as if he's trying to twist the ankle off on the way out. i will show you a little something about these names, Esau and Jacob. Esau is connected with the color red. He'll end up being the father of the Edomites, which means the people of red. He will sell his birthright, and birthright in the Hebrew is a homophone. In other words, it sounds the same as the Hebrew word red. And he ends up selling his birthright for red stew. So when you think of Esau, just think of red. That's, that's what he was all about. On the other hand, Jacob means to supplant, to grab, to grab and entrap. It means deceiver or trickster. Sorry for those present that are named Jacob. Your parents did not know that your name means liar, thief, stealer, trickster. Sorry, Jacob. 
You, you, would have think, you would have thought the gardeners would have known better, okay? <laughs> but it's a really good Jewish name, okay? A really good Jewish name. The third thing that happens, so first it's inside the womb. Secondly, it's at birth. The third thing is Jacob moves into tricking his brother Esau into selling him his birthright. And from that time on, Jacob and Esau are in a bitter rivalry for the first half of Jacob's life. Now, whether it's a brother or a sister, or for me, it was cousins, because I grew up with cousins all around me. Family rivalry is just a part of life. It's not unusual. It's not unnatural. The thing is, is don't make more out of it than you need to make out of it. Now, I can understand a little bit about sibling rivalry. My niece is here. I've got to be careful what I say, okay? Her uh, father's my brother. That's the way that niece stuff works. Uh, my oldest brother, Gary, graduated from, uh, with, with honors from high school. Then my next brother, Randy, four and a half years older than me, Ashley's uh, father, he graduated salutatorian. So I was the third steward coming through. They thought, man, they're getting smarter. Every one of them's getting smarter. This guy's going to be a genius. But boy, were they disappointed. <laughs> I was voted most likely to fail, and I've been working 45 years trying to satisfy that expectation. So. But you need to grow out of rivalries. I, you can't help it when you're, when you're kids and teenagers. That's all part of it. But eventually, you have to grow out of it. It took Esau and Jacob... Uh, half their lives to get past childhood rivalry. Now, obviously, parental favoritism can add to this problem, and that was the issue here with Esau and Jacob, is they, they were twins. Verse 27, we don't know how old they are. Most scholars believe they're young adults at this point. And Isaac likes Esau the best because Isaac thinks with his stomach. He's a typical man. And Esau is a good hunter, and he really knows how to prepare venison really well, just the way Dad likes it. So Isaac likes the guy who makes the better steak. That's who he likes. Re Rebecca, she likes the guy who hangs around the house more. Maybe he helps around the house a little bit more. So she was partial to him. And it, and it says that one loved one, and the other loved the, the, the other son. And it doesn't mean that they hated the other op opposite ones, but they did show favoritism, which adds to the problem in our story. That leads me to a third thing. Reckless people, and that was Esau, reckless people often devalue the best the family has to offer, adding to their messy lives. No matter how bad your family is, your family has something good to contribute to you. And when you ignore that good thing they want to contribute to you, then it ends up making your life messier. Esau was impetuous. He was unrefined. He was clumsy. He was no match for Jacob. Jacob was crafty, shifty. He was wily, and he, was, uh, and he could outdo Esau mentally. Apparently, the firstborn son had some type of birthright. We don't know what the birthright was for Jacob. In the Mosaic Law, which will come in, in later on, the Mosaic Law, the oldest son got a double portion of the inheritance. We don't know if that was happening here as early as Genesis or not. But financially, Esau ends up being just as wealthy as Jacob. Both of them are very wealthy men, so that's not a problem. As far as life going easy and well, Jacob has a pretty rough next 20 years. I mean, it's really, really hard. Esau probably had, had, a, had an easier life. I believe, I wouldn't stake my salvation on it or anything, but I believe that the birthright was to be the spiritual leader of the family. And Esau did not value being the spiritual leader of the family, and he sold that for a pot, uh, for a pot or a bowl of stew. Let me show you some things about these two guys that I think we can apply to our own lives, things about devaluing our family first. We often deceive ourselves into thinking the urgent is also essential. Just because something is urgent doesn't mean it's necessary. Just because it's urgent doesn't mean it's essential. So here's the scenario. Uh, it starts in verse 27. Uh, Esau has been out working all day in the field. He comes home. His brother has this big pot of stew cooked up, 
and he wants to eat. He's starving. Now, it sounds like he hasn't eaten in weeks. It's been a day. Okay, he went one day without eating. Now, I remember, it's been a long time ago, but I remember physically working, okay? One time, it hurt. I stopped. No. No, I, I know how it is to work really hard physically all day, and you come home, and you're hungry. I understand that. But he wasn't that hungry. It, it, it wasn't like he'd been a week. Hadn't he been three days? It'd been one day. He comes home, and he's willing to give up spiritual leadership for a pot of stew. How often do we think of our urgent need, man, I gotta have this now, when really, long-term, we need something much bigger. I know you wanna tell your boss off. I know you do. You've been working up the nerve, and so finally you tell him off. Five minutes later, you wishing you didn't. Impetuous, you wanted to do it, had to do it but then you realize you probably shouldn't have done it. Acting on a lustful thought, it's enticing for that moment, but the long-term effect is very different. Taking that gateway drug, so it's called now, using that gateway drug, I mean, it's legal in some of the states, it can't be that bad, and yet it never ends with that, it always leads to more. Being alone in a house with a boyfriend or girlfriend, trusting your own self. Oh, what a foolish mistake. Don't ever trust yourself. That's the biggest mistake we make. When we trust ourselves, we sin. That's the next thing we do. Putting that compulsive purchase on a credit card, just got to have it, got to have it, got to have it, and leads to indebtedness. All those are examples of how we deceive ourselves into thinking the urgent is necessary. Second thing to learn here is that we sometimes take advantage of others' lack of discernment. Jacob took advantage of his brother Esau. Esau apparently wasn't the brightest guy, and obviously he thought about his immediate need only, but still Jacob is not in the clear. He is not innocent. He takes advantage of his brother. I, felt, I feel sorry for Jimmy picking out songs for this series on Jacob. I mean, you're going to have to pick out country and western songs because that's about deception and lying and stealing. Amen. Rough crowd, rough crowd. Okay, I got you. <laughs> I mean, because that's, that was Jacob. That's who he was. He was always trying to get an angle on somebody, find somebody's weakness so he could get them and trap them, and that's what he does to his brother. And he says to Esau, he says, oh, yeah, if you want something to eat, I'll give you something to eat. It's going to cost you your birthright. And Esau doesn't have any more foresight than to go ahead and go for it. Third thing here is devaluing one's heritage often leads to devaluing one's family values. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about here. Look at the last phrase of chapter 25. Chapter 25, verse 34, the very last phrase says, so Esau despised his birthright. He took everything that his family had brought for him, everything that his family had invested in him, and he said, I'm not interested in that. Now skip to chapter 26, the very last two verses of chapter 26, starting with verse 34. Time has passed, and then it says in chapter 26, verse 34, we'll talk more about this next week. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as his wives, Judith, daughter of Bera, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Alon, the Hittite, they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Now, I want you to notice two things about the choice that Esau makes. First, he married two women. That was his first mistake. Second mistake is both women were pagan. He married outside the faith. Maybe it was one of those things that we've heard before. Well, Maybe I can convert them. Maybe they'll come to this side. But that was the mistake. He married paganism, and by doing that, he threw, his, he threw his hand up against everything his mom and dad had invested in him. That leads me to the fourth thing to look at, and that is our manipulation and faithlessness add to our messy lives. In this passage, especially 
when you read it in light of Romans chapters 9 through 11, some might see the doctrine of predetermination or predestination for personal salvation in this passage. But Genesis 25 verses 22 and 23 are about God electing or predetermining who is going to be a part of the lineage that will bring the Messiah to the earth. We cannot exonerate either character in this story. There, to this point, there's not a good character. Esau's not good, Jacob's not good. Esau was short-sighted, Jacob was a traitor. But the worst thing about Jacob is Jacob followed in this point in his grandfather's footsteps with a lack of faith. You might know the story, Abraham. He received the promise that he's going to be the father of a great nation. He can't, not, he can't have any children. He waits and waits, tries and tries, nothing happens. Finally, his wife says, well, Hagar's over there. She's young. Why don't you just have sexual relationships with her? And Abraham, in his lack of faith, instead of trusting God, goes ahead and has a relationship with Hagar. The result of that is a child. And you say, well, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, those things happen. Not that big of a deal. Do you not know your history? Not that big of a deal. Do you know the reason why the Jews and the Arabs hate each other and have hated each other for 3,000 years? It goes back to Abraham and Hagar had a son, Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of the Arab people. And then Abraham and Sarah have the promised child, which is Isaac, which is the father of the Jewish people. What you think might be helping God may create a 3,000-year war. Be careful trying to help God. God doesn't need any help, which leads me to a second controversial issue that the character of Jacob brings up, and that has to do with the sovereignty of God in our lives. First, don't mistake the doctrine of the sovereignty of God with the false doctrine of Calvinism. Let me explain a moment. That God is sovereign means that God doesn't have to consult anybody to do what he wants to do. He didn't have to consult Abraham, Isaac, Esau, Jacob. God doesn't have to consult anybody. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. The doctrine of Calvinism teaches that God has already predetermined Who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost? And there's nothing anybody can do about it. You're just stuck in that. But the issue with Jacob is that he feels he has to manipulate and trick his brother into helping God. But God didn't need Jacob's help. Jacob was supposed to walk by faith. And our job is to walk by faith. Now, can God do his big plan even when we don't walk by faith? Yes, because he's sovereign. So the loser in this isn't God. God doesn't lose his plan. What happens is Jacob has a messy, messy life for 20 years because he tried to help God. Maybe his mom, I don't know. I'm assuming because mom liked Jacob better. Maybe his mom had told him, hey, the prophecy is you're going to be the chosen child. You're going to be the child by which the lineage goes through. But God didn't need Jacob's help. God didn't need Jacob being deceptive. God didn't need Jacob playing tricks. What God needed Jacob to do was to be faithful. God would have still done his work. It would have been much neater. God's sovereign. He's going to accomplish his plan. The problem is going to be how messy is your life while he's doing his plan. But he's going to do his plan. I have no doubt about that. The question is how life is going to look for you while that plan is taking place. From the world's view, Esau, the oldest, should have been the heir. That's the way it worked. Despite God's historical covenant commitment to uh, uh, ethnic Israel... God's mercy from the very establishment of the nation of Israel was something that was always unexpected. Instead of going with the expected oldest son, God goes with the younger son. And Paul uses that analogy in Romans 9 through 11 to write to the Romans 
and teach them that it is really faith in accepting Jesus as God's Messiah as the way you enter into this covenant relationship, that, that it's not about whether or not you're Jew or non-Jew, it's about what you do with your faith in committing to Christ only. As Jimmy makes his way to the front, let me close out with some statements here. We, we can derive from Paul, and you would have to read chapters 9 through 11 to understand everything I'm talking about. We can derive from Paul's use of this account of Jacob and Esau that God's salvation is available to all persons who place their faith in Jesus Christ only. And that God commissions the church, us, to harvest members of faith from all nations. The point of Romans 9 through 11 is that God's grace and his mercy is available even if you're not Jewish. Praise the Lord because as far as I know, there's probably not a whole lot of Jews in this room today. So praise the Lord that God's mercy is offered to anybody. So no matter what your background is, as messy as it may be, God offers salvation to you. So the last line on your printed outline there says this, I can live by faith in Jesus Christ, which means living by his truth instead of my manipulation. And God will use me for his purposes. See, when I live by his truth, that means there's no gray, right or wrong. That means there are absolute truths. That means it's always wrong to lie. That means deception's always wrong. Manipulation is always wrong. Stealing is always wrong. There are things that are always wrong. And when I do those wrong things, it's sin. And it's that very sin is the reason why God offers mercy to people like us. And that's the story from the messy life of Jacob that gets us to our point today. God, I pray for people in this room that they need to move out of their messiness and move into you, into a relationship with you. God, I know that you don't want for us to live in sin, and yet I know that humanly we do that, we mess up. And God, I pray that we would turn to your mercy and forgiveness, that we would repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and place our faith in Jesus Christ only. And God, for Christians in this room that maybe have been tempted to use their upbringing as an excuse, Lord, I pray you would teach us that we are bigger than any mistakes even in our family and that you also want to extend mercy to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.